Welcome back to Longton Art, everybody. My name is Dan Longton, and today we're going to be talking about painting a landscape uh, using the Bister technique from an imprimatura. Now, if you're not familiar with what an imprimatura is or a Bister technique, uh, I have a link. I'll add a link to the end of the video to, for you to go back and view that. Uh, it's just a recap. It's a pretty simple process of staining the canvas with a thinned out version of an earth tone, usually a warm color, and then wiping away highlights and adding a thicker, more opaque paint layer for your shadows. Uh, it's a pretty broad stroke, no detail type of approach. Uh, and today we're going to actually continue on. So uh, the reference that I'm using for this particular painting is this guy right here. And uh, after that, after I've basically taken my canvas, now I believe this canvas is 8 by 10 on masonite that I've prepared in gesso, prepared in gesso. I also have a video on that. I will add that video at the end as well. Uh, basically gridded the image, drawn it out, sprayed it with spray fixative, got the bister on, and that is in this state right here. And once that's completely dry, you want to give it a couple of days to dry, then you can start over your overpainting. And there is multiple ways that you could approach this, but the way that I do it is I always work in layers. Uh, if you've watched previous uh, videos of mine before, I talk about layering and building up the image from a, a good foundation, which is uh, an imprimatur or underpainting technique. Uh, there's multiples out there. We talk, I've talked about Verdaccio's. I've talked about Bisters, I've talked about Grisaille's, and I've talked about the, the straight Imprimatura burnt umber layer. Um, I'll have a video on the Verdaccio, which is usually a, a green layer. It's usually used in portrait painting. I'll have that up here shortly, probably in the next week or two. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But today we're focusing on the landscape technique. And no matter what I do in terms of the subject matter, whether it's a still life, a portrait, or a landscape, or a combination of any of those, I always work in these kind of stages. And this is what I mean by layers. And I want you to take a look at this image right here. So on the bottom of this little triangle, on the bottom of this triangle, you know, you can see your composition, your major shapes, and I usually use large square brushes. These are these kind of this kind of build up into the top top tier of detail. Uh, it, it kind of keeps your focus more addressed on larger things and then building up uh, the layers to the highlights and details. And if you work this way, it makes the process a little bit more enjoyable and a little bit more controlled because you're not thinking about the details right from the get-go, uh, which is kind of why the, the, the Bister is a good technique for a landscape because you're dealing with a lot of texture. And when you're dealing with texture, texture, uh, and I, and I want to make one thing clear that, you know, when I say texture, I don't mean like the actual roughness of the canvas or, or the physical peaks of paint. I mean visual texture, you know, the implied texture of grass, fur, leaves, trees, clouds. These are all textures that are implied on the canvas or the surface uh, rather than a physical texture. Now, I will probably do a video about impasto painting, which is a very thick, lots of peaks uh, of paint, but right now I'm talking about purely implied texture. So when, you when you're talking about painting a landscape, you really can't be thinking about painting individual leaves on a tree before you have the shape of the tree in. And that's kind of what you can see in my bister, uh, you know, right here. Uh, what I do is I usually start off with larger brushes, and that's usually in, in my composition, major shapes. I'm thinking about major shapes, and I'm using a larger brush, and I'm spreading paint very quickly, and the large brush keeps me from thinking and adding certain levels of detail. Now, I'm going to add, you know, you can see that you can, you can tell what I'm painting in my bister, you know, some of the texture in the, the trees, but they're just basic shapes and I'm, I'm i'm focusing on the major shapes now once that dries and i start building up the image i will then switch to medium-sized filbert brushes because the square it kind of leaves these ridges uh the square brush usually leaves these ridges on the side of it you know when you pull when you pull the brush it leaves these two heavy edges on there and a filbert is kind of rounded it's kind of like a square brush that's been rounded at the tip and it avoids those kind of buildups of texture physical texture 
and those two little ridges on the edge of the brush. But on the second layer, I'm focusing on minor shapes. I'm focusing on shadows, and I'm definitely focusing on localized color. So if it's a green, I'm trying to get my values correct. Uh, hue is not so much uh, as important as value, uh, but definitely I am thinking about trying to get an accuracy of what type of green. Is it more leaning towards the blue side? Is it leaning towards the yellow side? Is it a natural yellow? Or is it a warm yellow? I always want to knock down my saturation, which is the intensity of that green. And I, because I want to build up to those highlights uh, and that level of saturation that's in these kind of layer buildings of textures. Because if you've ever looked at a tree, and, and I'll, I, I'll, let me show you something here real quick. If you look at a tree and take a look at this image right here, if you start to think about the shape of the tree, because the species of the tree, is defined by its shape. You know, if you think about a cypress tree or a, a pine tree versus a, an oak tree, you know, the shape is very distinctive. A live oak looks definitely different than like a, um, you know, like a, uh, a white oak. You know, there, there are two very different types of trees. There's four, over 400 different types of species of oaks out there. But a live oak, you know, if you've ever been you know, to a state park where live oaks are growing naturally, they, they have a tendency to kind of go out and huge, huge branches and trunks that kind of bend down to the ground and it's kind of supporting itself on the ground by, uh, you know, these huge limbs. Uh, but anyway, this tree right here, which is an oak tree, I want you to really focus in on the color because the first thing that you kind of want to do is you want to kind of build the color forward because the highlights and where the light is actually being hit on the tree is actually closest to you. And all of the shadows are around the back end of the tree. So it makes sense that you would focus your minor shape of the tree because your major shape is already developed in your composition and your bister. So the next layer would be the minor shape and it would actually be the shadows. So the back side of the tree, and this is typically the darkest of the green that you're going to be laying in there. And after you, you, you paint this kind of darker green, and on the next layer, I start building up my midtones over that layer. So my texture strokes start to get broken up, uh, and they're building up slowly of midtones. Usually there's multiple variations of paint value and hues of the different types of greens in the tree. Because, you know, if just looking at this tree here, uh, you can see that there's different types of greens in the midtones, there's not just one color of green. If you if you only think about you know shadow, midtone, and highlight, that's three greens. It's not going to be very volumetric, and it's definitely not going to look real because some colors look different than others, especially at the midtone values. Now your shadow color it really doesn't matter because you're covering most of it up anyway. But as you get into the midtones, you definitely want to have a variation of greens like cooler greens, more yellow, more blue, warmer greens, more yellow, more blue, and then you're building slowly up to the highlights, which are going to be your brighter, you know, maybe there's even a spackled light of white being hit off of some of the leaves, and you can see that in this, in this picture here. Uh, and that's, you know, you're, you're building up through these layers. So composition, this is usually your major shapes that are thought about in the bottom of the triangle. Minor shapes and shadows and localized color and, and value using medium brushes, then you start to introduce smaller brushes and mid-tones, but there, more variation of mid-tones. So you're building up to those highlights. And then on the fourth layer, this is really where you want to break out your round brushes and start to hit those little texture spots and hit those highlights. But you're not quite to the highlight yet. That is left for your very last layer, which is your detail layer, which you can see here in the triangle once again that the layer is actually, the detail layers is on the very last layer. So, and these are, this is the layer that usually makes it pop the most. And what I mean by pop, it really pops out of the canvas and starts to really grab onto the viewer because it feels three-dimensional and it's coming into the, the viewer space. So, so yeah, so where I'm at right now, I'm not quite finished with this painting. Uh, but I, I just wanted to show you guys where I'm at in terms of how I've gone about 
uh, building up the painting. And I'm about halfway through. I'm just about where I want my sky to be. Clouds are not the easiest thing to paint because you have to think of them as, as modeled forms as well. Almost like you got to think about them like, like cauliflower a little bit. Uh, and then you, you also have to think about warm and cool grays versus blue grays uh, versus uh, highlights. So I'm right about where I want my sky to be. And the trees in the landscape definitely have uh, some distance to go uh, before I really start to tighten up the landscape. I'm just now starting to get uh, the warmth in the sky and the warmth in the grass. And I'm going to show you here real quick the kind of the whole process from uh, underpainting all the way up to the current state. And I will probably update uh, the video at some point and do the whole, uh, the whole process through and through on Instagram in a 30-second clip with some music. Uh, yeah, that's the process of, of painting a landscape. And I can't emphasize it enough that texture is not going to just magically appear. It comes through all sorts of strokes of variations of colors. Uh, or hues and values. So you really have to study where the light hits. And, and that's really what I was talking about with that tree and really breaking that down. So yeah, so it's, here we go. Let's uh, just take a look at the painting. As you can see, you know, it's starting to develop, but it's not quite complete yet. And, you know, I still leave it kind of like a painterly. I'm not trying to make it photorealism. You know, I don't really want to get rid of all of my brush strokes all of the time. You can really see that in the highlights now on the stage that it's at, especially in like the trees that the leaves are very rough right now. I'm going to leave a lot of that. I'm gonna, and I'm definitely going to let it dry uh, from today's session and uh, where which is where it's at right now. Uh, you know, there's something to be said about leaving your stroke, you know, your painter's stroke in the work. Uh, yeah, you can go crazy and, and, and really bl over blend and blend things out and have everything this kind of soft, uh, you know, and when you zoom in on the images at the end, you know, you really can start to see some of the, that my hand in the work. It's the same thing in drawing, you know, when you, your mark on, on the canvas or the page is going to be different from the person next to you to the person on the Instagram everybody's mark is a little bit different. And this is kind of my mark. So I don't really want to remove me from the painting. Uh, and that's just food for thought uh, when you're going in. And the thing about it is, guys, you're going to figure out that you might make mistakes on color. And I mean, I do it all the time too, but it's not about how many mistakes you make. It's how you choose to correct them. Because usually there's something to be said and learned from those mistakes. And when you really start getting good about painting and, you know, just art and composition and design in general, you start to learn to recognize what's going to be a mistake later on. And then you start to avoid them. And that's really where you kind of make the shift and the transition from a novice to more of a professional is that you can recognize these before they're major problems. Uh, but th even then, if you recognize it at the end and you sign it and you say, oh, you come back two years later or five or 10 years later and you say, wow, I can really fix that right now. And you do, well, then you, the painting's not really done and you, you still recognize that it was an issue and you solve it. So, I mean, you kind of have to let the painting speak to you when it's done. So uh, food for thought, that's pretty much where I'm at. And uh, I will update this video at some point on Instagram. Uh, you can follow me again. It's at uh, Longton Art on Instagram, and I will do a short 30-second transition of start to finish all the way through the process to the signed painting. So uh, if that's it uh, for today, uh, thank you for watching, and please like and subscribe if you like the videos, uh, and tell your friends. Uh, thanks for watching. Again, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, maybe a week or so for the Verdaccio, so stay tuned for that. Thank you guys again for coming and watching.